You know, uh, historically, uh, an SM57 is sort of like the go-to snare mic. And uh, the reason why it is is because uh, snare drums sound like snare drums with 57 mics. <laughs> It really, it's not rocket science. Uh, there, and not that there aren't other snare, snare drum mics out there that are very worthy and sound amazing. Um, but you know, in a situation like this where you have your own home studio and I have a lot of producers coming in here, uh, the visual plays a lot. And when they see some weird out there mic that they have no idea, is, it may sound fine, but because they saw a different mic, that snare drum doesn't sound right now for some reason. There's a little psychology, <clears throat> but uh, 57 sound amazing. And uh, <clears throat> I'm constantly, this, this is the mic that I'm actually, I constantly am adjusting. And the way I adjust it is uh, depending on what I'm looking for in the snare, snare drum. If I pull up a snare drum that is too ringy, <clears throat> I'll try to maybe pull the snare mic up a little bit and aim it more towards the center. But if I'm wanting a little bit more ring, I'll aim it, you know, get that mic down a little bit closer to the rim. So it picks up some more, more of those overtones. Um, some some guys, you know, there's so many different techniques of miking a snare drum, and I'm sure somebody watching this will say, oh, that's completely wrong. What about the phasing? What about the, you know... Well, you do have to watch phasing. That's a, definitely a big issue, and I, I always check the phasing, but... Uh, for in, in general, layman's terms, if you want more thwack, I usually get it up higher and aim towards the center. If you want more ring and sustain, bring it down lower, aim towards the rim. And so somewhere in between, I'm always, you know, these are great isolating headphones I've got here. And so I'll put these on and I'll start adjusting and try to find the sweet spot for that snare, for that song. Oftentimes I'll, I'll actually tune the snare drum in and the toms uh, tonally to the key of the song. And um, so it's important to keep that kind of stuff in mind. But also that's thing you might notice on this, on this particular mic, I added a little uh, a foam shield to help reduce a little bit as much as you can, I mean, you obviously can't, without starting to affect the actual sound of the mic, but uh, to shield a little bit of the, the hat coming over some of the higher, higher tones. Um, and so that proximity effect isn't quite as bad, but you do the best you can, you know. Honestly, uh, bottom mic, snare drum mics, I'm not a huge, gigantic fan of bottom mics. I personally don't monitor t with a ton of them, but I know engineers that love them, and it's an integral part of their sound. So. I always record them. Um, when I'm actually mixing the project, I don't use a lot of it, but I have them there always. <laughs> but you know, 57 seems to work fairly well. I mean, you can. Everybody has their own idea of what a great bottom snare mic is. Some guys will use a two mic. Some guys will use a larger diaphragm mic. I, I think a 57 is just fine for all practical purposes. So, on a hi hat mic, um, the idea is. Uh, where you want it more towards the bell or towards the edge. And to the edge, you get a little bit more woofier sound. Towards the bell, you get a little more uh, of the crispness. Maybe it's the opposite of that. <laughs> At any rate, the important thing is to is adjust it and find the tone you're looking for. This is a Shure uh, uh, SM141, I believe is what it is, 141. It's got different patterns you can select, so it kind of helps this isolate a little bit better. But um, but yeah, basically I'll, I'll adjust and try to find, once again, for each song, sometimes, um, I'll adjust it for different parts of the, to get different elements of that, that hi-hat out. Um, if you want a more beefy sound, sometimes I'll get it more out to the edge and, you know, uh, but if you're looking more for tighter, maybe more towards the, the bell, so. Okay, so on Tom's, you know, a pretty standard drum mic is the, the Sennheiser 421, and that's what these are, and, uh, they, I think they sound amazing on, on toms, and they're a classic. And there's a reason why they're a classic tom mic, is because they make toms sound like great toms. <laughs> so, um, as far as positioning is concerned, um, you know, if you took the shield off, you'd see more how it's, it's aimed. It's, the shield is a little bit deceiving the way it looks, but uh, the, the uh, aim of the mic is, you know, pretty much straight ahead. And so I try to get it somewhere between the rim and the, in the center of the drum here and up a little bit because if you get it too close and you get a lot of the overtones happening. Um, but you get it too far away and you start, everything else gets into your tom mic. Your tom mic becomes a snare mic. <laughs> but um, if you, you know, I used to put foam shields on all my tom mics um, to isolate them from like overhead crashes and whatnot. But then it, uh, I realized that, you know, in Pro Tools you can just 
clean that up very easily. <laughs> so I just, uh, I just uh, leave them the way they are. Different engineer philosophy is some guys are like fix it in the mix engineers and some guys are let's make it sound like the record engineers, you know. I think I fall somewhere in the middle there. Um, uh, for one, for saving time because sometimes finding the perfect, most rocking, locked in drum sound is uh, you're kind of spinning your wheels and wasting your time. Uh, uh, if you can get some great general rocking great sounds that are clean and have all the elements of what you're looking for, uh, EQ-wise. The, the toms have enough punch, the, have enough bottom end, your snare has enough girth. Snare is usually, I think, probably the, the hardest thing to get correct. Um, and, uh, and the snare probably is the thing you hear the most on any track that you're going to play on, right? Makes sense. So that's probably where I focus most of my time, is trying to get the EQ correct, getting the you know, the, the, the bottom end correct, the crack enough. You know, some people uh, are referencing uh, songs that are pro producers a lot of time, oh, I, I like the way this record sounds. Well, <laughs> the problem is sometimes when you're giving them raw drum sounds that are not hyped up, compressed, or sound replaced, it doesn't sound anything like that, you know. And so oftentimes when I'm um, doing a drum track for somebody, and particularly internet tracks, I'll uh, slap a little bit of compression and effects on them so they kind of get the idea of what it will sound like. I don't print it that way, so they have the flexibility to do whatever they want to do with it. But uh, if it helps them uh, envision what the song will sound like with the effects on, I'll do it just so they can hear it. Yeah, these are, um, these are f just simple AT uh, Audio Technica 4033s, um, and uh, they're not, they're, I gotta say, they're one of the, the best workhorse. Microphones, and this is slipping out, it looks like, uh, available. They work on a lot of different situations. And I found, I've AB'd these against more expensive mics, and uh, I've just found that um, the price differentiation for, say, putting up a couple of C12s, uh, sonically, I don't hear a, that much of a dollar difference, <laughs> especially considering the way people mix drums nowadays, but uh, with very little overhead. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, these are wonderful mics are very clear and um, I, right now I've been experimenting with a semi XY pattern uh, where uh, one mic gets to side. I used to put them out like this, hard left, hard right, um, but just to switch things up I've been moving around a little bit to see uh, the different sounds you can get, you know. Well inherently, we, this is, my studio is in uh, the bottom of my house here and so the, uh, inherently the, the ceilings are not as high as I would, I would love to have. Um, I'd love, you know, 20-foot ceilings, that'd be amazing. So the big deal with uh, smaller, lower ceilings are a thing called standing waves, in which it is, uh, at a certain frequency, the waves start bouncing back and forth and create this sort of like dig -a -dig -a basketball court sound effect. And uh, you have to minimize that as much as you can. And, um, you know, these are all foam. And so it's, it, this room isn't horribly bad because we got some angles in it. Um, but you really minimize with putting foam up and anything to deflect and mutate where the waves are bouncing. So um, I've got some on the back absorbing. This floor is a concrete floor, so there's a ton of ambience in this room. And so I'm not lacking for ambience. So, I'll, um, so I've created like these little, these little baffles, these little gobos and uh, to help. If I want a tighter sound, I'll bring the gobos in tight and so we can get real direct sounding drums. Or uh, if I'm looking for a wide open, kind of roomy rock sound, <clears throat> we'll uh, pull the gobos out and make it more wide open. So, uh, Kick drum, I always use, uh, I have a D112 mic, which is, a, once again, it's a real standard kick drum mic. And uh, I have, I don't know, probably three or four different kick drum microphones, but I, I tend to end up using the, the D112 most of the time because uh, I just like the way it sounds. It has a plenty of bottom end and uh, the top is nice. And so I end up, put, I'll generally put the, uh, the, the microphone as far forward as I can and uh, off, off center and then I aim the actual mic towards the beater in, inside. That's a good general, it's a good jumping off point for kick drum sound. Then of course, you know, EQ wise, it's, you, you know, you take care of some things in the control room, but so the, the idea is the combination between this external, um, it's called a sub kick, which is basically a, uh, it's a uh, NS10 woofer or speaker, 
and it kind of captures its reverse phase, and so it kind of captures the um, everything about 200, 150 hertz and down. And the idea is to mix this kind of outside rumbly sub thing with the inside, and you create a really cool multi-dimensional kick drum sound. That's the idea. <laughs> Whether it works all the time, you know, I love it though. It sounds great. I've been on sessions where we've done that, where we've put a microphone on the front side, just like a regular drum, and um, I don't see what the, I guess it's cool for an effect, but ultimately what happens is the snare drum gets into it and the toms and the cymbals get into it. What's cool about having the, the kick drum mic inside the kick drum is that it isolates the kick drum, <laughs> which is pretty nice. So <laughs> I dig that. You know, like I said earlier though, sometimes I'll pull the kick drum mic out right to the hole or even in front of the hole if you're looking for a more rounder, puffy, ambient sound, you know. Um, like I said, you have to, you know, tune the mics and drums into the song that you're playing on. So, for the different effects. Beater-wise, um, I just go with a normal kind of felt beater, but it was interesting. <laughs> I, was, I did a session one time where <laughs> the, uh, I'm sorry, let's just say, the client comes in and goes, okay, um, how many bass drums do you have? I said, well, you know, four or five. He says, right, I want to try every one of them. Okay, well, great. I said, how many beaters do you have? And I said, well, with me, I only have like three beaters. He says, oh, I need to leave five or six different beaters. I want to hear every beater you have. <laughs> That's never happened again, interestingly. <laughs> so we tried every beater I had. Uh, but generally, uh, a hard felt beater does really well. And um, sometimes if I'm looking for more of a, a puffy, uh, softer sound, I'll like take the stuffing out of the kick drum and use like this, uh, it's like a wool beater. And it's, it's, it takes away a lot of that top and attack. It's great. Different flexible, you know. Got some ribbon mics there for the room mic. Uh, something kind of a cool mic that I use for a lo fi mono uh, room is this. I got it wrapped up in here, but it's uh, actually a harmonica, harmonica mic. It's called a Green Bullet. Sure makes it. It's pretty cool. Kind of a grungy, kind of distorted, cool. You mix in there, you know, to, uh, to whatever level you'd like. <laughs>